Good afternoon and welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. My name is Ben Kalos. Uh, if you are watching at home or the live stream, please feel free to participate by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. I have the privilege of co-chairing today's hearing with my fellow council member, Justin Brannon, who happens to be uh, having a number of bills heard today. I'd like to thank the members of the committee for coming together to hold today's hearing, and I'd like to also uh, thank Co-Chair Brennan, as well as Councilmember Helen Rosenthal for sponsoring the legislation before the committee today. Today's hearing provides the this committee with an opportunity to hear several pieces of legislation that span two frequent issues facing this committee. The first details the uh, late payment from city agencies to city contractors, which is a recurring problem for vendors trying to receive their payments due from the city. Uh, and the second deals with cost overruns in large contracts, which continue to plague the city's procurement system, despite the improvements in transparency we have achieved in the last several years. In a report earlier this year, City Caller Controller Scott Stringer identified roughly 80% of all contracts came to his office for registration after they had already begun. This means that the majority of city vendors are performing work on city contracts without being paid. Vendor payments are regularly late, and in most cases, there is no explanation. Nearly 40% of contracts do not arrive at the controller's desk for over six months after they begin, and these numbers only improve marginally when removing city council discretionary contracts from the equation. The fact remains that many of our valued vendors across the city contracting, but particularly in the nonprofit and human services sector, have no choice but to take out high interest loans, reduce their staff hours, or liquidate altogether. We as a city need to do better to support these organizations providing essential city services, and it is our responsibility as a council to make it happen. This is why today I'm proud to uh, sign on to my co-chair Justin Brandon introductions 1448, 1449, 1450 to address these late payments to city vendors by creating an office dedicated to facilitating interagency oversight review of unregistered contracts to assist in expediting their registration, requiring the Economic Development Corporation to offer bridge loans to vendors for contracts under $500,000, and ensuring that a nonprofit contractors receive interest from the city whenever their payments are late. I'd imagine co-chair Brandon I'd like to discuss these bills in a bit more detail, and I'll turn the floor to him in a moment. But before we get there, I'd like to turn to the next topic before the committee today, cost overruns in city procurement. In response to several oversight failures, including city time, the emergency communication self transformation program, NICAPS, and others, the council passed local law 18 of 2012, uh, which requires city agencies to submit quarterly reports to the council whenever modifications of contracts of $10 million more exceed 20% of the original contract cost. These reports also include a secondary list of so-called repeat offenders whenever those contracts require a second modification in excess of 10% of a revised cost, contract cost. While Local Law 18 has proved to be a fruitful source of information regarding the large contract modifications that have already happened, we believe it would be even more useful if the Council had access to this information prior to the modification occurring. Uh, I, I will also say that uh, when I did get my hands on those Local Law 18 reports, I found them uh, quite memorable. In fact, I've actually committed them to memory. Uh, and uh, the amount of overpayments is quite staggering. Uh, we're talking about billion projects of in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, and so uh, that, is a, that is a big piece of the budget when you're talking about any one document that involves that much spending. Uh, that's why I'm proud to sign on to Council Member Helen Rosenthal's introduction 1238A and 1311, which would, among other things, require additional detail regarding the nature of these large contract modifications, require the contracting agency to notify the Council at the same time modifications are submitted to the controller for registration, when the committee believe these pieces of legislation will collectively improve the vendor experience as well as ensure that city agencies are more transparent with respect to their procurement processes. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to thank Co-Chair Brandon for all of his dedication and leadership as the chair of the committee for the last year and a half. As the new chair, I hope I'm able to continue to lead the Contracts Committee in the right direction and take up the mantle as an advocate for improving city's procurement processes, uh, paying attention to our contracting processes, and ensuring that uh, we are saving money wherever possible. And as a government employee, I'm a big fan of government employees and think we might be able to do it better quite often. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Councilmember Brandon for his leadership and good luck on your work on the com as chair of the Committee on Resilience, Sea and Waterfronts. Uh, before I uh, turn the floor over to co-chair Brennan, I'd like to thank Contracts Committee Staff Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Cassie 
Casey Addison, financial analyst, Andrew Wilbur, finance unit head, John Russell for all their hard work uh, putting this hearing together. Uh, I will also disclose, uh, we're joined by Councilman uh, Kalman Yeager. He and I like to spend as much time together as possible. Uh, yesterday we spent three or four hours together at GovOps. We'll spend even more time together here at Contracts. Uh, I must apologize, we are doing two hearings at the same time, back to back. I've been working on an issue called mechanical voids since 2012. Uh, so we are doing a hearing on the culmination of uh, those uh, seven years of work <laughs> next door. But I will uh, return as soon as that hearing is concluded. I will turn it over to uh, my co-chair, Justin Brannan. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, my name is Justin Brandon. I'm happy to be joining my colleague Ben Kalos in co-chairing this hearing. As the outgoing chair, I believe my official title now is Chair Emeritus, and I plan to wear it proudly. Um, as Chair Kalos mentioned, uh, today's hearing will focus on several critical pieces of legislation pertaining to late payments from city agencies and cost uh, overruns in city contracts. I'd like to join Chair Kalos and extend a special thank you to uh, Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal for her bills uh, that will improve transparency regarding cost overruns that we currently receive quarterly in the form of the Local Law 18 reports. Uh, I want to focus my statement on the three bills I have sponsored today, intros 1448, 1449, and 1450, each of which address the problem of late payments to city vendors. Intro 1448 would create a division within the Mayor's Office of Contract Services uh, or another agency designated by the Mayor that would regularly conduct an interagency review of unregistered contracts. The goal of this so-called late payment SWAT team would be to continuously review the oversight and review processes for procurement at each agency with the goal of reducing the number of retroactive contracts in city procurement. If the contracts aren't registered, they can't be paid, and this team would take steps to improve each agency's delivery time of awarded contracts uh, to the city controller. The SWAT team would also report its findings and make recommendations to the council, the mayor, and the procurement policy board. Uh, the next intro, 1449, would require the city's Economic Development Corporation to provide bridge loans to its vendors on contracts of $500,000 or less. Contractors who currently work with city agencies have access to the returnable grant fund for bridge loan funding, but since the uh, EDC is not a city agency, it can be difficult for its vendors sec to secure uh, those bridge loans from the, uh, the RGF. Uh, this bill will close that gap and provide EDC contractors with the same access to bridge funding as the agency contractors. Lastly, intro 1450 uh, would require interest to be paid by the city on late payments to nonprofit contractors. It's hard enough for nonprofits who need to wait in some cases six months or more to get paid by the city, but they're often forced to secure their own small business loans or downsize in order to balance their books until payment from the city arrives. This bill, uh, 1450, would at least soften the blow somewhat by ensuring that interest will be provided on those payments. Uh, provided that those payments are ultimately made. Uh, I believe these three bills, when considered together as a package, will assist in alleviating many of the concerns raised by our colleagues in the, Cindy's, uh, the city's vendor community, uh, and we look forward to hearing feedback on these bills and all the legislation before the committee today. Um, with that said, I want to hand it over to the committee counsel, Alex Polinoff, who can swear in uh, the folks from Mox, and we can get the show on the road. Uh, Thank you. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great. Thank you. You may begin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Kalos, Chair Emeritus Brannan, and members of the Contracts Committee. My name is Dan Simon. I am the New York City Chief Procurement Officer and Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. Thank you for inviting me to discuss proposed items which aim to increase transparency and accountability as well as strengthen oversight in procurement. As I have previously shared with this committee, MOX agrees with goals to overhaul any inefficient processes which bring about hardships. We are devoting resources 
to bring in greater sunlight to the entire procurement process by establishing a shared digital platform and a rational set of steps which will be readily known to all users. This approach has already helped to reduce the time it takes to vet vendors, enhance communication between agencies, and improve the quality of data used in daily operations or by managers who are responsible for continuous quality improvement. Specifically, through the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, or Passport, a cloud-based off-the-shelf technology solution, vendors now submit and update disclosure filings online instead of handling hefty paper packages. Agencies leverage information gathered by other agency staff, reducing the need for redundant questions sent to vendors. Information about regulatory filings, such as business tax, tax status or liens, are also readily available. Streamlined data collection and, share, and sharing has reduced vendor submission times and agency responsibility determinations, which took an estimated seven weeks prior to Passport's release one launch in August 2017, now typically takes seven days. Agency managers and oversights have monitored progress since launching since launch using real-time workflow tracking or system-generated reports. This transparency has pushed everyone to find efficiency and has led efficiencies and has led to increased accountability. Vendors also have greater insight into processing statuses, timeframes, and can escalate when necessary, increasing the incentive for timely task completion. We expect more encouraging results in the months after the launch of release two of Passport. This next release will focus on streamlining agency purchasing of goods and services from established citywide requirements, con requirements contracts. Release two establishes a citywide approval framework for purchase requests, enabling more detailed reporting on items acquired, specifications, and costs. We will be better positioned to make strategic decisions about the utilization of these contracts and to monitor, monitor both agency approver and citywide oversight performance. Vendors will have easy access to order data, will be able to manage their catalog of offerings, and can track receipts and invoices at a more granular level related to purchase orders submitted by agencies. Our experience with the first two releases of Passport lay the foundation for the most comprehensive overhaul of sourcing and contract management activities to date. This spring and summer will be used to learn from implementation of Release 2 and solidified design of and protocols for Release 3. Release 3 addresses many of the most pertinent points of frustration related to the structuring and release of solicitations, management of proposals and evaluation, processing of awards, tracking and submission of packages for registration, as well as amendments, change orders, and renewals of contracts. Vendors and agencies will be onboarded over the course of the launch period, in addition to the phasing in of standardized invoicing and payment. This council's drive to address challenges experienced by vendors is clearly shared by this administration. We seek a comprehensive and sustainable solution and are working to ensure that our shared vision is truly realized. The intent of intro 1450 reinforces the importance of efforts to achieve timely registration and implement policies that responsibly put resources in the hands of providers at the start of programs. For example, the administration's new 25% advance policy. In fiscal year 18, roughly $1 billion of advance payments were dispersed to providers at the start of the fiscal year, creating cash flow when providers need it most. For human services providers, fast electronic invoicing, pro invoice processing times are documented once contracts are registered. With Passport, we expect similar results with the, given the approach we take, using standardized budget and invoice templates between agencies and vendors, creating flexibility for task assignment at agencies, making statuses visible to vendors, and error-proofing data submission through multiple levels of approvals in agencies. Prior passage of this Council's legislation to support electronic invoicing will help us make progress beyond human services once the financial modules are made available through Passport. We would like to learn more about the intent of Intro 1450 and how it may be aligned with the current contracting practice, budget and invoice structures, and prompt payment guidance. It is worth noting that payments for human services contracts are typically based on line item reimbursements for incurred costs. While we share the goal of ensuring on-time payments, we do not believe that backwards-looking interest requirements are the right tool to do so. We believe the best way to do so is through transforming the procurement system itself, and that is where our focus is. Intro 1449 also seeks to bring financing relief to vendors. It does not appear to differ much in its proposed scope and operations from the Department of Small Business Services existing contract financing loan fund. We encourage further discussion with SBS. The Council's interest in management of contracts under the authority of agencies has helped make reported information clearer for oversight and public review. 
in the case of intro, intro 1238A's proposed expansion of Local Law 18 of 2012's reporting requirements, there has been progressive improvement in the descriptions of project cost increases. We continue to work with agencies to document their management decisions when scope and associated costs increase. A contract modification does not always indicate contract mismanagement. Agencies may change scope due to many factors, including citywide policy changes and field conditions discovered after a project start. It would require tremendous effort to immediately, efficiently, and usefully report in detail on all unrelated contract amendments associated with a vendor that appears on the revised Local Law 18 report. Further discussion is needed with regard to submission timeframes and the information sought by Council. Finally, Intro 1448 focuses on central procurement issues. In the current landscape, there are numerous actors with varying responsibilities. Accordingly, it is challenging to strictly assign responsibility and enforce penalties for delays to either vendors, agencies, or oversights since, ta since tasks are interdependent and milestone status is not objectively documented. When we move beyond the paper world, we can achieve our goals and enable real transparency and accountability. We will make relevant data, progress milestones, and responsible parties viewable on screen, ensure system reports can quickly pinpoint bottlenecks for line managers, and help executives make decisions. Lastly, we will continue to maintain Passport and guide staff and vendors to maximize its use via our help desk, training, and change management offerings. Given the diversity of policy goals and operations across agencies, MOX has necessarily evolved from traditional oversight to building and deploying scalable tools that will make it easier for everyone to execute tasks efficiently and build situational awareness to manage more efficiently. We are working to make data more readily available, understandable, understandable and actionable. This will help oversights, this committee, and the public fully participate in building a high-performance procurement ecosystem. Fostering this approach and maintaining these tools create the conditions for real accountability. And this is not just a role for one division at MOX, it is core to our mission to achieve fair, responsible, and timely procurement. We execute our duties in collaboration with other oversights and senior leaders at agencies, convening partners, and sharing data to address emergency, emerging issues. But as procurement transforms, MOX must be, remain nimble, scrappy, and able to reorganize divisions as new needs emerge. We are lucky to have a committee that is as passionate about reforming procurement as we are, None of us are satisfied with the status quo, and we share the sense of urgency you bring to these matters. Concerns expressed today simply seek to highlight existing initiatives or bring attention to issues which might limit impact without full digital transformation. We remain committed to acting now and are doing so with vendors and agencies as we tackle backlogs and establish renewal policies which encourage timeliness. We look forward to co-designing scalable and sustainable solutions with this committee and look forward to meeting with the new chair and others soon. Before I conclude, I want to thank Councilmember Brannon for his service to this committee and express my thanks for his efforts while he was chair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm joined by Ryan Murray, First Deputy Director, Victor Old, General Counsel, and Ann Meredith, Deputy General Counsel. We are happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I want to acknowledge and turn it over to uh, my colleague, Councilwoman uh, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, former chair of the Contracts Committee, Brennan. You did such a nice job. Um, we're all sorry to see you go, but we'll be happy to get a new chair as well. At least the committee, uh, anyway. So it's so nice to see you. I'm just going to make a quick opening statement. Um, I do appreciate Chairs Brandon and Kalos for holding today's hearing. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, and I'm pleased to speak about my bill intro. 1238A. The City of New York spends billions annually on capital projects carried out by third-party vendors. As stewards of the City's money, we must take measures to root out waste and fraud and ensure that everything procured by the City is high quality, efficient, and cost-effective for the taxpayers. Intro 1238A mandates additional reporting when modifications of 20% or more of the original value are made to capital contracts over $10 million. The additional reporting will include detailed explanatory language, a requirement designed to hold both the contracting city agency and the vendor accountable. 
In order to further prevent delays, waste, and abuse, the bill also shines a light on vendors with multiple contracts who request large contract modifications. The new documentation will appear on the cost overruns report that is currently required by Local Law 18 of 2012. It will include a detailed accounting of the total number of proposals submitted to the city prior to its awarding of the contract under review and whether the selected vendor has any other contracts with the city which were similarly delayed. What we're trying to get at here, and it's important to make this clear, especially to the people doing the work, the contractors themselves, particularly in the construction field, is if we can clarify the reasons for um, why a contract go up, and if the reason is conditions, that's of course perfectly normal and explicable. We expect that to happen. And what will be so great with these details is that we will no longer, even, it won't even cross our minds that the problem of conditions. We'll be able to focus on the areas where we have real concern, areas of scope creep, areas of um, overcharging or other things that could be going on and we'll be able to not have to worry about conditions on site. We know that happens, so certainly this bill does not want to imply in any way that the issue is conditions on the ground. In fact, just the opposite. When we look at the reports, um, the problem this bill is trying to address is the myriad changes with no explanation why something is changed. And indeed, if things are changed because you know, we're not just fixing one fire station, now we're fixing three fire stations. That makes sense, but we need to get to the details, we need to understand um, more about it than simply we're doing three fire stations now, not one. Um, that's what this bill seeks to improve upon. We don't want local law 18, which had very good ideas and good um, initial intent to be rendered meaningless, which is, I think, where it stands right now. And it's not used by the administration or the council or people who have oversight responsibility for city spending. It's been rendered useless. And so now what we're trying to do is make this meaningful oversight again that's what we're trying to do with 1238A, and to the extent that you have suggestions to tweak it, make it tighter, make it better, we're, we're with you to make, we have a common goal. Um, I'll go on to say that my legislation adds new disclosure requirements to, lo to the local law 18 secondary report, which would, which would be triggered for any contract modifications that are at least 10% of the revised contract value or are at least $10 million in size, whichever figure is lower. Finally, 13, 20, 13, blah, 13, let's start that again. Finally, intro 1238A requires simultaneous disclosure to the city council and the controller for contracts that exceed their original maximum expenditures of 20% or more. And I just want to come back to one more thought, um, especially um, Chair Brennan and Chair Kalos, um, having been chair of the committee, one thing that bubbled up as a concern as we looked into contracts together with the Mayor's Office of Contracts is noticing that Perhaps a vendor um, will submit a bid that appears lowest and most reasonably priced, but then with all the change orders, gets up well beyond what another bidder proposed, which may have been the actual true cost of what the project was. And what we're trying to get at with this legislation is to be able to do that look back 
So as you know, the city continues to select vendors, perhaps we will be able to identify a vendor who, you know, in lay terms, is lowballing it just to get the contract, um, but then fully intends over time to have the cost get up to what the real cost is, which is what another vendor submitted in the first place. That's another thing. You know, we have all these theories of why contracts grow exponentially, and we're trying to identify if there are um, triggers we can identify or things we can find out about each of these contracts that will help us keep our contract costs in line over time. So I want to thank our committee chairs again for holding this hearing, as well as committee counsel Alex Polinoff, thank goodness, staying right where he is, um, and Casey Addison, and of course my legislative director, Ned Terrace, for their work on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. I want to acknowledge, uh, count, we've been joined by Councilwoman Inez Dickens. Um, Barron. Inez Barron, oh my God, Inez Barron. Um, okay. A uh, couple things on Local Law 18. Um, what role does MOX currently serve in, in the process of, uh, of change orders? Um, is MOX involved in reviewing every change order on agency contracts? So we're certainly involved in the, in the, in the, the full procurement process from an oversight perspective, but not every change order would come through uh, MOX for approval. There's a variety of business rules which we can share with you that would make it either come to MOX or not come to MOX. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, what are some of the reasons why contracts might exceed their initial costs? Are, are they all problematic reasons or are there some you know, good reasons? Yeah, for sure. Uh, as as Councilmember Rosenthal alluded to, there are you know there are so passport for instance, right? There's there's uh, planned phases to the project, but they're sort of not uh, fully planned out and costed out, and so we haven't really structured them uh, to be included in the in the base contract just yet. We don't want to sort of plan for something that is so far down the road that we don't really have a context for what the cost might be, and so a phased project would reasonably sort of build on itself. Um, same, I would say, for HHS Accelerator. Um, there are also uh, field conditions, as, as uh, Councilmember Rosenthal alluded to as well. You are at a building, you're pulling off aluminum siding, you then see you have a termite condition underneath, now that's not, that, that's not something was planned, and so you now have to amend that contract to do something completely different and not something that you had thought when you had first let the contract. Um, and so there's all sorts of field conditions. Again, a phased project might be another example. Um, but I'm sure there are other sort of ways in which we can get at the, the real cause of these, uh, uh, these change orders and contract amendments. That, uh, that I think the bill alludes to. We, we certainly agree with the transparency aspects of Local Law 18, and we want to work with this committee to figure out how to make it uh, a useful uh, exercise. Can you give us an idea or, or, or get us an exact number of how many change orders meet the criteria of, of Local Law 18 annually? We'd have to gather the reports over the past, you know, whatever time you want. We can get back to you with that exact number. Because I'd just be interested to know, if the committee uh, would be interested to know, the, you know, how many are the responsibility of the contracting agency versus the vendor? Um, how often are these changes, change orders denied by either the agency or the controller? All that stuff. And, and what are some of the typical reasons why they're denied? Um, how are contract modifications or extensions processed? Could you walk us through the steps? Sure. So it's, it's not much unlike a regular contract registration, depending on the dollar value. Um, but you're, you're executing an agreement with the vendor. Uh, so a contract, a, if it's for time only, then there's no financial impact. If it's money and time, then it's, then it's both. And so there's a variety of different ways in which uh, th these things sort of take, uh, take shape. 
um, but essentially you're agreeing to uh, a contract with the, uh, the vendor, you're determining that they are a responsible vendor, you're then uh, uh, getting that contract uh, registered with the controller's office, just like any contract action. The difference with an amendment is that typically they are retroactive because they're a condition that you've recognized within the term of the original contract, right? So in, the, in whatever example you want to choose, um, they're not always, an amendment is not always a future date that you're working towards. It's a, a, a no, it's, it's a discovered condition that you now have to change the scope of the contract um, to account for. And, you know, so you, you know, you open up a street for a particular project, you notice a, a field condition that's very different than what you thought. You've now got a hole in the street. You can't have, you know, sort of put everything on pause, wait for the, the amendment to get registered before you go and, and work on the project. And so things sort of have to happen uh, while the procurement process is playing out. Um, you see that happening in human services as well, right? You have human service, you know, an increase in the number of service levels that, uh, that we need for a particular uh, vendor, and we'll amend the contract accordingly, but the uh, vendors will sometimes work at risk um, while the, the uh, agencies catch up with the procurement process. That is, you know, exactly why we want to move these processes along much quicker, which we think Passport, Passport will do. In the how would Passport improve modifications or extensions? So basically putting the process in a fish fishbowl, just like everything else. Um, so you, right now we have a very uh, manual, uh, sequential, and paper-based process. Um, there are some internal city, city systems that do some of the tracking, but not very well. Um, and so a system that has a vendor and a city, the vendors and the city working together in the same, on, the, on the same platform, in the same space, looking at exactly the same things, it's, it's, you know, there is no collaborative space for them to work together right now, and nobody knows who's responsible for what sometimes, and so uh, being very, very clear about what a, va a vendor needs to do, what documents or data they need to provide the city, what the city needs to do, um, it will be made very clear on both sides, and that will move things along much quicker. Um, as it stands right now, does the administration have the ability to determine um, if cost overruns on a contract were the result of underbid, underbidding by a vendor? So that, that's very difficult because, uh, so the bid that's coming in um, is, uh, the, the information used to establish that bid is known by all the vendors submitting a bid. And so there's, a, you know, it's a, an objective process. Um, if someone is underbidding, there is also cost breakdowns that uh, agencies ask for to ensure that the price is fair and reasonable. Um, we're happy to talk more about uh, what some of the drivers of what you think might be causing that would be. Um, uh, certainly an interesting area to focus on. Uh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know that it's very easily detectable that a, you know, a, a higher bid at the, uh, in the original contract uh, would result in anything different um, uh, during the life of the contract. Can, um, can you say if the administration is opposed to making the Local Law 18 reports uh, available to the public? I know they're, they're currently foilable, but it adds an extra step. Would, um, would you agree to voluntarily place the Local Law 18 reports on, on the MOX website? We're submitting them to the council, um, so I don't, I don't think we'd have any real objection to them being public. Councilman Barron? Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this committee meeting. Thank you to the panel for coming. I apologize, I'm a little late. So we're now going to have the release three of Passport, is that correct? So actually release two is happening uh, this weekend. Um, we'll, the Passport will actually go down late Friday um, and come back up Monday morning with release two functionality live, if all goes well. Um, release three will be roughly uh, a year from now. A year from now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So release two 
Release three is going to be for change orders, for structuring and release of solicitations, management of proposals, and evaluations and modifications. What is release two going to be doing? So release two is essentially the supply chain of the city's requirements contracts. And so the city has, uh, through DCAS and other agencies, have requirements contracts for it's mostly goods, but there are some services there. Um, and it's basically a catalog buying environment for uh, DCAS's vendors to- Catalog uh, buying environment for yeah. DCAS. So okay. agencies will be purchasing goods and some services, but mostly goods uh, through these requirements contracts uh, in an online platform, which will be Passport Release 2. Okay, and how have we found that um, comments from what might have been uh, stumbling blocks in Release 1 have been addressed and helped to make it smoother for release two moving forward. Sure, I'll start. Maybe Ryan, you could take that. Um, so release one for sure. I, I think each release will build on itself. Like I said, release one, you take lessons learned. Even though it's different functionality, you're you know they're they're sort of staged um, purposely in the way they are so that by release three, the, the, the real main overhaul of procurement, we're getting it as close to right uh, and perfect as we possibly can. Um, release one was a replacement of what was formerly known as Vendex. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, clearly the benefit of going online with a very arduous manual process has reaped obvious benefits uh, for the vendor community. Um, what used to take a month for just mocks to process and paper is now taking the vendor themselves typically a day. Depends on the complexity of their corporate structure, um, but it's, it's been reduced to a typical online account maintenance type activity for them, um, and so much, much easier. Um, the other thing that we're doing in release one are uh, using that information and other data uh, to do what's called responsibility determinations. So essentially a background check on our vendors when we have awards. Um, and uh, so the, the sharing of that information across agencies, which was never done before, has reduced that time frame from what used to be uh, roughly seven weeks is now taking typically seven days. Um, and that's because uh, agencies are sharing information on vendors, they're sharing uh, documents that are requested uh, of vendors um, and other city oversights, um, and that's drastically reducing the time it takes to compile this all from scratch each and every, uh, for each and every award. Um, and so those are sort of essentially the, um, the, the core principles that we see that are working, which is full transparency and accountability of who ha who's responsible for uh, a particular task who has it next, um, what the full process is, and how long is it taking, and being transparent about how long things are taking. Um, that, I think, has created a lot of speed, and we're taking those principles into uh, release two, for sure. Um, release two uh, with the requirements contracts at DCAS was a, uh, a hodgepodge of uh, some internally built city systems, some manual paper processes, um, and so bringing that into an online environment, we expect the same uh, type of results, right? I think the, the two other things I would add, frankly, is that what we've done in release one is establish our service model and strengthen that a little bit more as an organization. So while the functionality is gonna be different for release two, uh, there are thousands of staff that use Release 1 to look up vendors and find things. So Release 2 is going to be about browsing a catalog, as the director said, to find items and be able to put them in a cart and so on, right? We uh, have a help desk and we have a technology team that uh, is able to listen to and process user feedback. Um, what that results in is either direct support today. Um, we have shifts where people are responding to questions all day, whether in writing or picking up the phone and calling folks. So I think the lesson from release one is really how we manage that process um, in terms of providing support. And then finally, uh, our tech team uh, is has processed over 800 different enhancements to the system since we went live. 
um, that is a concrete measure of how we're listening to whether it's the agencies or the vendors, um, whether it's a tooltip on a screen or functionality just isn't working the way that we intended and we need to streamline workflow and then we up, make those updates and we deploy that. So I think the enhancement process and our support model is what we've taken a lot from release uh, one. That'll be something that we're doing for release two as a setup um, and thinking about how that you know, will evolve for release three, which is not just these requirements contracts, it's kind of inside baseball how we order, but for everybody else. And not, we have experience, obviously, with human services providers and that kind of support model of Accelerator, but we are expanding how we do this for the entire city for all industries, so. How we, could I be able to have a hands-on walkthrough in real-time uh, experience so that I could understand directly? Yeah. Uh, we're happy to host you uh, at our office or come to your office uh, and sh show you how the system works, That what's currently live. And, and who, then who will I be, who's, whose number, whose name am I going to call for? Uh, you you can reach out to me directly. I'll, I'll make sure that staff has my card before I leave. Okay, great. And then in terms of the legislation that's being proposed today, uh, in your testimony, it says that uh, you'd like to learn more about the intent of intro 1450 and how it be aligned with current contracting practice, budget, and invoice structures, and prompt payment guidance. Uh, then you said it's worth noting that payments for human service contracts are typically based on online reimbursement for incurred costs. While we share the goal of ensuring on-time payments, we do not believe that backwards-looking interest requirements are the right tool to do so. Could you explain to me what you mean by that, backward-looking interest requirements yeah I, th I think what you're what the so as we I mean we'd love to hear more from the council as well to make sure we get this right um, that's that we are willing to work with council to figure this out I think what you're saying here in the legislation if we understand it correctly is that there are interest payments uh, based on a deliverable schedule that is established in the contract as the director shared in testimony, um, our note there is to say that um, in human services particularly, you don't often have a deliverable schedule that's in the contract, right? What you're doing on a monthly basis uh, is taking your invoice for costs incurred and you're submitting that to the city agency. The issue that we have here with prompt payment in, in the way you're thinking about it is that the contract's not registered yet. So the thing we need to fix is speeding up registration. It isn't, it isn't about the interest payments based on a schedule because we were late in paying. We were late in registering, which didn't allow us to pay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So have you spoken directly with the sponsor about that particular aspect? We're happy to, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Mayor. Um, just a point of clarification of something um, from earlier. Is, is it a new responsibility determination required for modifications or extensions? So responsibility determinations are, are required on every award, essentially. Sometimes they take a lighter, so it's, it, it'll sometimes be called a, an RD light um, in, in an amendment scenario, but at each award you are determining a vendor responsible. Okay. Um, some of the late payments and register contract stuff. Um, would MOX be willing to create an unregistered contracts division like the one proposed by 1448? So as we said in our testimony, essentially what you're describing is what MOX will be in a future state. So upon release of uh, release three and the ability to have a full 360 view of the procurement system in New York City, that would be our role. Um, we are looking to take ourselves out of the sort of uh, the critical path of um, looking that, ev you know, ensuring that every box is checked, right? So right now in a manual process, we have to make sure that the box checked is the right box that is checked. Um, but in a future state, we're building a system that will sort of, uh, to some extent, foolproof that the rules are being followed, 
and allow agencies, procurement staff, to be far more strategic. Right now, there's a heavy focus on ensuring that every regulation, every law, every, uh, you know, every sort of statute is followed in the procurement process, and MOX plays a day-to-day -day role of ensuring that they did that correctly. What we're trying to do is to streamline the process is take some of that sort of decision-making to the extent that it can be standardized um, and formulated uh, in a system that then takes the human element out of it a little bit. Um, and so what that frees agencies up to do is be more strategic with their procurement. It allows MOCs to be more strategic as well, meaning we can now focus more on what the system data is telling us instead of being such a heavy compliance agency. We'll still do compliance oversight for sure, um, but we'll be, we will be able to do it differently. Um, but our, our goal with a system that sort of encompasses uh, the entire procurement process will allow us to focus on retroactivity uh, and payment issues constantly. Uh, do you have a number of how many uh, retroactive contracts are currently pending registration? Uh, I, I can get back to you with an exact number. It's sort of, I mean, it, it, I would just come back with a, a more specific uh, and what's, what's which, which contracts you'd be looking for, whether that's city council discretionary or are we talking about amendments or just base contracts? We just uh, we could come back with. I think yeah, anything that's retroactive, that's that's still the cursor is still blinking on it. What what does Mox currently do to to coordinate um, speedy registration of these contracts? How is Passport going to help that? Well, Passport will help for the exact reasons that I laid out around sort of uh, why uh, Mox's vision is aligned with uh, one of the intros. Um, uh, but what we're doing currently is to the best that we can identify retroactive items for sure. And we are, uh, we have got, we're spinning up some accountability tools, uh, blasting that out to the agencies, letting them know exactly where they are, how many they have left, uh, how many they have, how many they have left to go, how many are registered, what, you know, sort of timeline goals to, to get across the fish, finish line on these things. Um, and so those are, we're sort of MacGyvering the, the you know, the, the oversight process um, retroactivity to uh, the best we can. Passport in the future will, uh, these things will be sort of obvious, not only to us, but to any user of the system, particularly vendors, they'll understand exactly where their stuff is. Um, but we're also, we were also uh, instituted a renewal and extension uh, policy that forces agencies to um, start the renewal and extension process much earlier than they do, than, than they have done in the past to ensure that, you know, for a July 1 registration, they're starting the process early enough so that they are registered on time. Okay. Um, is anyone here from EDC? Okay, um, I have some EDC questions. Uh, I'll put them to you to see if it's something Mox can answer. Um, the, the city's uh, returnable grant fund offers bridge loans to qualified vendors. Um, is there something similar, do we know, currently offered by EDC? And would EDC be willing to implement um, the proposed language in 1449? No one's here from EDC, right? right? No one's here from EDC, right? I don't believe anyone's okay. from SBS or EDC is here. We know of the, uh, the loan funds at SBS and EDC um, and can take the questions back. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely having EDC uh, support something similar to the RGF would be, would be very helpful. Um, if not, um, we'd love to know what changes they think need to be made, sort of broadly speaking. Um, aside, I mean, do you know, the administration via SBS or other agencies, do they currently offer bridge loans for for-profit businesses seeking to do business with the city? So SBS has the, the contract financing loan fund. Right. You know, we can speak to its existence, but uh, I think detailed questions would, uh, should, are better left to SBS and EDC. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal, you have anything else? Uh, just real quickly to yeah. follow up on a point you were making, um, former Chair Brandon, 
um, and that is about expediting some of the contracts. I think the fundamental issue that we're all grappling with, and I know you are too, and we're looking for a little help here on how we can all help really the human service providers get paid faster. And I think, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to get at here is an award is made, but then it takes a lot of time between award and contract registration. Um, do you have a sense, and we're, so what we're trying to do is shine light on it, right? So that therefore we can, uh, you know, identify where the problems are and, and then try to take care of those problems, like what you just brought up where you found something that had taken seven weeks and now it takes a week, or technically seven days. But um, we want to find all those things because in fact the vendors aren't being paid until six months or a year or 18 months after they were awarded the contract and started the work. Um, are there, and I, I see how Passport will be helpful. Do you have sort of SWAT teams now where there are, and this gets to um, the intro, I think 1448, I'm not seeing it right in front of me. But do you have SWAT teams now where you know something, um, yeah, 1448. Can you, having been um, director of MOX for so long, are there certain contracts where you know ahead of time, oh, these are gonna be some of the ones where the vendor doesn't get paid for eons until after they started doing the work. How do you shine a spotlight on it or how are you addressing that now? Meant to be a softball question. Uh, yeah, so we so we are uh, we have spun up some uh, accountability tools to uh, put agencies on notice and uh, make them very much aware of the situation at hand. And so we have a tracker on all of the retroactive items. Um, again, it's it's not every uh, it's not every contract, and we can sort of come back with uh, uh, other contract data. Uh, that you're requesting. Um, but we have a sort of retroactive contract tracker that we're working with right now. As you know, the mayor um, recently uh, committed to uh, reducing the backlog of retroactive items. And so we are working very hard to make sure that agencies are well aware of where, uh, of, of uh, how they're doing with respect to those retroactive contracts. And we see uh, that uh, of bearing some fruit, um, you know, uh, putting folks uh, in a fishbowl like we talked about with Passport, uh, the, sh the sunlight helps and it, and it moves uh, people along uh, much quicker than they otherwise would, particularly when the process is manual. In a future state, when the process is digital and open and transparent, right, you don't have to use those same tactics because everyone is aware um, of where things are and where they stand and reports are easily obtainable to understand. Um, but in the current manual state, we, we have to spin up these tools and we're, we're certainly working on that. Um, the other thing I would just add, and I'm not trying to minimize the, the, the impact of the, the issue whatsoever, um, but this is a, uh, an unintended consequence of so much investment in the human services sector. And there are thousands and thousands of amendments that have been processed um, and registered. Um, and I think we are at the tail end of that wave um, and uh, it's and so and fully committed to getting across the finish line. There will always be amendments, um, but we're trying to uh, uh, make a uh, a real surge and push on the final tail end of all the investments that the administration has made. Is it possible to maybe we'll talk more offline on the technical process of how amendments work, um, with the hopes of not having that unintended consequence. Um, you know, we're talking about the fact that the city council urged the mayor to put in, uh, you know, $50 million this year, $100 million another year, $100 million another year for various aspects to add funding to various aspects of, of the contract to bring them closer to what actual cost is for the nonprofit providers but perhaps there's some way, we'll 
passport help with contract amendments? For sure, yeah, it is intended to cover all of that. We're, we were in design sessions early this morning uh, talking about the, the, you know, the transparency aspects, particularly around contract amendments and what vendors will be able to see immediately uh, once, a, a con once an amendment is sort of created, every, all parties sort of understanding what are the steps to get this thing done, who, you know, who's responsible, you know, what the, what the vendor is responsible for, what the agency is responsible for, and tracking progress uh, efficiently. Um. How many contracts are in the retroactive contract tracker right now? Uh, I, can, I can get that number to you. I don't have it right at my fingertips. I'd like to follow up on that. Sure. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Chair Kellos. Uh, thank you to my co-chair for, uh, uh, Chair Emeritus for helping out and to Council Member Rosenthal for spending the entire day with me so far. Uh, between being in two hearings at uh, once. Uh, I just want to do a follow-up question on, on passport. Uh, this, I think, follows up on a question I asked a year or two ago just around with the new passport rolling out. Is it something that folks will be able to access from home and from their mobile phones or whatever devices they may have? So vendors can certainly uh, log into their accounts from home. Uh, city staff uh, need to be on the city network or some other VPN option. Um, it, uh, where, so iValua is the product that uh, Passport is built on. There are some pieces of it that are sort of uh, mobile friendly. iValua, I-V-A-L-U-A. Uh, is it, what, what is the, uh, it's, it's a CMS? It's an off-the-shelf e-procurement uh, system. Okay. There, uh, uh, we could, I can provide more information about iValue if you like. Yes, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and so I guess the question is, will people be able to just look things up from home or from wherever if somebody's watching and is curious about even the contract for Passport, uh, will they be able to pull that up? A, a vendor, for sure. No, a member of the public. We, we're joined here by multiple members of the press. Will they be able to just pull up the contracts and do it? I, I, I view the press as a co-equal branch of government. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can talk more about what the public will have access to. There are various laws that make uh, that compel us to provide uh, uh, data in a public setting, and we can certainly talk about that. Uh, I don't know that uh, you know we're, we're not established at the current in the current state to have public access to the iValua tool itself. Uh, okay, uh, we, will, we will discuss it more. Uh, Section 4-12, the Procurement Policy Board rules, addresses late registration of city contracts and requires MOCs review each agency's performance twice a year. Uh, are you prepared to discuss agency performance pursuant to this section? 4-12 of the PPB rules uh, has a provision at the end that uh, says that if the city is providing an interest-free loan uh, to human services providers that uh, interest is not required to be paid. We view the availability of the, of the returnable grant fund as meeting the obligation to provide that interest-free loan to city providers. And so while we agree categorically that the city should do a better job in terms of registering contracts uh, that are retroactive, uh, we, we do feel that the uh, availability of the loan fund uh, sort of meets the obligation that we would have to otherwise pay interest on those contracts. How large is the loan fund? So the, the loan fund is roughly 68 to 70 million. How much of it is encumbered every year and repaid every year? Uh, I, we can come back. We've reported to this committee on the, the amount of loaned out uh, each year. Happy to get you those details. But, but I think to date we've loaned uh, over $100 million. Uh, to, through the fund. I think there's been 112 million or so that's been requested. We've, we've loaned, uh, this is estimating here, we've loaned about 100 million. Mm -hmm. And that's been over the last year and a half, or that would be? Fiscal 19. It's, it's fiscal 19 to date. Okay, so you, you've gone to roughly 100. Well, it's, a, it's a revolving fund. Yeah. Right, it's, so it's you've gone to about 130% of, of the loan balance in the past year. So, well, so what I would say is it's a revolving loan fund, and so it's meant to bridge the gap to registration. 
And so it's a loan to a vendor. Once the contract is registered, then the loan fund is repaid. Have you ever had to reject an application because you had insufficient funds in the, in the loan fund? No. We have, you know, we have at times sort of spaced out. So some vendors will come and ask for three months worth of their contract. And we think that the contract will be registered in one month. And so we will sometimes adjust uh, the approved amount to account for uh, uh, the registration timeline. But uh, no, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't reject an application. We haven't rejected an application because of availability. How much have city agencies paid an in interest pursuant to this section? Well, generally, again, I, I think that the, the premise that we're operating on is, is slightly different. The city has paid, I believe, in fiscal year 18, about $150,000 in interest. But again, interest being calculated from the point of registration on the contract, I think the issue that we're trying to address here is the retroactivity of contracts, which is mm -hmm. resulting in what we're perceiving as late payments. And I guess which agencies have been found to be in substantial noncompliance, meaning that they submit contracts to registration in an untimely manner? That's information that we can get back to you on. Uh, later today? Might take a little longer than later today, but we can certainly follow up with more information about that. Tomorrow? Uh, we can we can go back and look at it and come back with a timeline for when we can get it to you. Next week? <laughs> I'm just looking for a date certain. It could be 10 years from now, it could be next week, but I just need something by which you, you know that you can, there, there's 80 agencies. So you know in universe. We can come back later today with what a timeline could be. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it two weeks. We're going to have another hearing within at least the next two weeks, and please make sure you have, some, have what we're asking for in hand. Okay, we're going to call up our first panel. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we have uh, Alan from Catholic Charities. Catherine from Homeless Services United. Uh, Carlin from CPC. Michelle Jackson from HSC. I'm just mad you didn't bring me one. <laughs> okay, uh, Alan, you want to start? Thank you. Been present. Oh, I'm sorry. Now it got me. Got me now? Yes. Good afternoon, members of the council, past and present. My name is Alan Wallenitz. I'm the chief financial officer of Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens. For those of you that may not be familiar with our agency, I'll give you a brief profile. Uh, we are not-for-profit entity. We're under the auspices of the Diocese of Brooklyn. In 2018, we serviced close to a quarter of a million clients throughout Brooklyn and Queens. We provide services to some of the most vulnerable residents of the city, the poor, the elderly, and the immigrant populations. <coughs> Excuse me. These services are provided regardless of, regardless of a person's race, eccentricity, or religion. Specifically, our programs revolve around integrated health and wellness, which include behavioral health clinics and services, family services, including senior centers, early childhood programs, and we're also a major provider of affordable housing in the city. I'm here today to lend our agency support for the three bills, 1448, 1449, and 1450 that are currently before the committee. The issues that are dealt with in the bills, which include expediting city contracts valued at more than $1 million, requiring agencies to provide bridge drones on an as needed basis, and the requiring the city to pay interest on late contract payments are all vital to an agency like ours. We currently have 60 city contracts with a value of $57 million. 
By definition, there is no profit margin in these numbers. The 57 million is spent in its entirety in providing contract services to our clients. And any gap between funding and meeting our financial obligations clearly create a hardship for the agency. We have no leeway in meeting its payroll to the employees who are charged with servicing our clients. I'm sure the committee understands that managing cash flow in a not-for-profit is not uh, an easy job and, and a very difficult process. We feel that these three bills take a very substantive steps towards creating a more formalized methodology for streamlining the flow of funds between city agencies and its contracted providers. We at Catholic Charities appreciate that these bills are on the hearing today and hope they will soon be passed by the City Council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Alan. Questions? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Catherine Trapani, and I am the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. And I want to express my gratitude to the Council's Committee on Contracts, particularly Chairs Brannon and Kalos, for calling this hearing today. And uh, in absentia, I'd also like to thank Council Member Levin for his steadfast support of the homeless services sector. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, HSU is a coalition of approximately 50 nonprofit agencies her serving homeless and at-risk adults and families in New York City. Uh, HSU provides advocacy, information, and training to member agencies to expand their capacity to deliver high-quality services. We advocate for the expansion of affordable housing and prevention services and for immediate access to safe, decent, emergency and transitional housing, outreach and drop-in services for homeless New Yorkers, and more. HSU's member agencies operate hundreds of programs, including shelters, drop-ins, food pantries, home base, outreach and prevention services, and the bulk of our work is funded by government contracts. It is via the nonprofit sector that the city is able to uphold the right to shelter for thousands of homeless New Yorkers, and it is via the work of our sector that we have successfully brought over 2,000 individuals in off of the streets via our outreach efforts. We have been seeking support from DHS and testifying before this council since at least 2015 regarding the harmful impact of delayed contract registrations and payments to nonprofits. In response to the crisis, we established a joint committee with our members and leadership from the Department of Social Services, Finance, and DHS budget teams to workshop bottlenecks in the registration process to take responsibility for our providers' roles in ensuring cooperation with the contracting process and appropriately managing our workflow. The committee has proven extremely helpful in resolving major cash flow issues for individual members in real time, as well as for helping members struggling with closeouts, invoicing, and audit concerns. And so I want to publicly thank DSS and DHS for their partnership and the progress that we have made to date. Um, we had hoped that through this partnership um, and implementing process improvements that we could rectify the delays that we've been discussing this afternoon, but our patience is wearing thin. Despite our best efforts, 98.9% of all DHS contracts were registered retroactively in fiscal year 2018. Compounding the challenges associated with delayed registrations is the inability to register amendments because of this backlog. This has added additional financial pressure to nonprofits. When a contract is not registered, the city cannot add the funding necessary to implement new initiatives to improve services, and the provider must wait until their underlying contract for baseline services is registered before monies can be added for new initiatives touted by the city as part of their turning their tide against homelessness plan. Examples include the model budget initiative from 2018, which was meant to bolster services, improve shelter conditions, and appropriately compensate staff. Because the amendments needed to pay for these enhancements are still not registered, nonprofits are in the position where they're fronting money to pay for these initiatives, implement COLAs, hire social workers, improve maintenance and the like without any compensation from the city for months and in some cases years. In other cases, nonprofits have delayed implementing the announced improvements for lack of funding and services to clients and performance have suffered as a result. The good news is, is that we are in a substantially better position in the current fiscal year when compared to last, but still uh, the last update I got was on January 30th of 2019, which was the halfway point of the fiscal year. 10% of the current year contracts were still not registered. Um, and regarding the amendments, the last pro progress report I got was in October and it was even less promising. At that time, there was still over 400 contract amendments uh, still pending. 
and the lack in uh, this means that we're still relying on lines of credit to meet the expenses. In many cases, non-emergency repairs are not getting done, and we're hiring and retaining staff is still a challenge. Until the full backlog of contract amendments is addressed, conditions and services are not going to markedly change. The city had informed us that they aim to clear the backlog by May of this year. However, we have heard from our uh, partners at MOX, who just left, and the NRC, that DHS continues to lag behind its sister agencies in terms of progress towards clearing the backlog and, uh, and uh, achieving timely registration in time for FY20. At a recent NRC meeting, uh, contracting officers from several city agencies presented on the status of their efforts to ensure timely registration. DHS at that time had only sent out 20% of the upcoming fiscal year's contracts to provider by the target date set by MOX, which was a key metric of whether or not they'd given themselves enough time uh, and runway to get agreements back from providers and do the necessary due diligence to ensure registration prior to the start of the next fiscal year. All of the other agencies reporting were substantially further along. The next lo uh, lowest progress report uh, noted had sent out 50% of their contracts compared to DHS's 20, and most others were at or near 100%. It continues to be a grave concern that DHS has been unable to resolve the backlog despite uh, concerted efforts from our community to do so. Uh, it is therefore HSU's belief that additional tools are in fact necessary to ensure timely contract registration. In the event that timely registration cannot be achieved, additional support for the nonprofit community is also necessary to help providers appropriately bridge the gap in government funding and continue to provide quality services on which our clients rely. DHS has committed to providers that all of this funding will be in place soon as the procurement uh, schedule normalizes and they are able to better plan for future fiscal years. We are hopeful that once the baseline budgets are in place, the fiscal health of the sector will improve enough to allow for more investments in comprehensive service-rich programming that will enable our clients to recover from homelessness more quickly and support their transition to permanency. In the meantime, we're very thankful to the Council for your advocacy and, and uh, support in helping us get there. And specifically, we appreciate the spirit in which you offer intros uh, 1448, 49, and 50, calling for increased oversight, access to loans, and funding for interest payments resulting from the delayed registration. We cannot continue to shoulder the burden of subsidizing the city by providing uh, core services without compensation. We look forward to continued work with the council and the administration to improve the procurement process and thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and I can answer any questions. Good afternoon and thank you very much to Chair Kalos and Chair Emeritus Brannon for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency, providing critical human services to over 60,000 Asian American and Pacific Islander, immigrant, and low-income New Yorkers throughout all five boroughs each year. We're pleased to be here today to testify in support of intros 1448, 49, and 50, which would bring much needed oversight, bridge loans, and interest payment support to the human services sector. CPC's programs are fairly well known throughout New York City. You might be familiar with our adult literacy program in which we make sure that new immigrants to New York have the access to English language for workforce and education and navigating. You might be familiar with our senior services program where we provide meals and other important programming for seniors or perhaps our early childhood services where we provide culturally competent and uh, dual language support for our youngest New Yorkers. But maybe one of the programs of ours that you don't know is one of our biggest but maybe least popular programs, which is subsidizing the city of New York for providing human services that are mandated to be provided by the city that CPC carries out every year. In this program, we do different activities like filling the gap between the indirect rate on our contracts between what is reimbursed to us and what it actually costs to provide these services at about a million dollars per year that we're subsidizing the city. In this program, we also wait for the city to pay us on the services we're already providing and try to track down late payments by working with different agencies and with MOCs. Currently, CPC is waiting for almost a million dollars in money owed to us from New York City on services that we are already providing. In this program, another thing that we do is pay interest on those late payments. Last year, CPC paid $157,000 
in interest that we had to take out in loans in order to fill the gap while waiting for those payments. And that's money that until now, we didn't have the opportunity to get back. And that money has a real impact on our community members. That $157,000 could have been used to provide a full year of after school education for 50 young people. It could have been used to deliver over 1,500 meals to our homebound seniors who might not get nutrition otherwise. Or it could have been used to provide adult literacy classes to nearly 150 New Yorkers that need that support in order to have dignified lives in their communities. So in conclusion, thank you very much for your leadership in this and continually fighting to ensure that the full cost of doing human services in New York City is covered. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Human Services Council. We're a membership association of about 170 human services organizations in New York City, both direct providers and coalition groups, and we work on city and state, particularly procurement uh, areas. So first I wanna welcome Chair uh, Kalos, uh, to the wonderful world of government contracting, your face already um, <laughs> speaks to uh, you, uh, <laughs> you're joining the storied company of our past chairs, <laughs> Rosenthal and Brandon, um, who you know who've really taken on these issues, and so um, we hope to not scare you too much, um, but uh, I'm going to. <laughs> so first, I want to thank the council uh, for including 100. I, I don't scare easy. I don't know good. if you noticed. Okay, good. <laughs> um, for the, First, I want to start with a thank you to the council for including $106 million uh, for indirect funding and for $89 million for early childhood salary parity in the council's budget response. I think those are two really important areas I've testified about before, particularly the salary parity. Um, while early childhood is only one part of the human services sector, I think it speaks to the movement in terms of paying human services workers fairly for their work. Um, so I wanted to start with a thank you and then move on to Groundhog's Day. I've done this testimony for, I think it hasn't changed that much in 11 years. I have a cool new shirt, but you know, like that's, um, the rest of it is just. <laughs> I, I, I've been admiring the shirts. Can you tell folks what it says? And did you get it printed just for this hearing or you used it for <laughs> past hearing? So this says no procurement, no peace. And uh, this is the rallying cry of <laughs> Council Member Brannon. Um, and so this is for this hearing, but we will be carrying the movement forward. <laughs> do, you, do you have one in his size at a value of less than fifty dollars? We do, and he will be getting it. He will be receiving it after this hearing, and it is definitely valued at less than fifty dollars. If I can get one too. Absolutely, We're <laughs> we'll initiate you into the group. <laughs> um, so I think first I want to say that, of course, we support the bills um, to pay interest on late payments and also um, the development of a SWAT team because that sounds cool and also because it's really necessary. Um, these are issues that we've, um, the pro problematic procurement process is well established. I think you've heard from direct providers and from HSU, you'll hear from more about, they can tell you more clearly how those issues impact their organizations. But um, one of the things that we just released today is our GovGrader. And the GovGrader, this is the second time we've done this survey, and it's a survey of city and state government agencies by nonprofits who contract them. So it's kind of like a Yelp for, for government agencies. The, the city this year went from a B minus, which was their score last year, um, to a C. The state stayed the same, but the city went down um, a whole grade. Um, Every agency under the city went down except ACS, which I actually think speaks to what we know, which is that our providers have said that ACS is an uh, organization that they like working with and that they feel like the staff really understands their needs. Uh, providers in the comments expressed clear frustration with the delays that they have said over and over to us this year are the worst that they've ever seen. Uh, in addition to that, they're really struggling with confusing information management. They feel that the city agency staff don't have clear direction and are asking for things they haven't asked for before, leading to a lot of confusion. And the GovGrader, it's still qualitative information, but it's the same things we complain about and I bring to you, but it's a way of us saying, this is a sector-wide issue, and the results, I think, really speak to what we've been talking about. I'd also like to point out that a C seems average, but no one in New York really wants to eat at a C restaurant. <laughs> And so it's while well, it's a passing grade, it's not doing great. And also nonprofits don't have another restaurant to eat at. Uh, they have to eat at the city government procurement table and you want them to. If they took their business away, we would have a really big gap in, this, in the city in terms of how we would procure services. Organizations like CPC and Catholic Charities Brooklyn Queens, if they gave up their contracts, which more organizations are moving to do, they are looking at closing down 
levels of service in certain programs that because um, of the delays and also because they don't pay enough um, in order to do the services. And you don't want that, we don't want that to happen. Um, I'd like to point out, I think, um, when Dan Simon testified, there's a couple of things. The NRC, the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, is doing good work, and we think that Passport will be a great asset um, to the procurement environment and help change things, but it's also, it's just not enough. I think in the NRC, something like the cash advance policy, it only kicks in once the contract's registered. So if a contract takes six months or a year to register, that cash advance doesn't do a whole lot for you. Uh, so something like interest is really important. The state has a prompt payment law as well that is problematic for its own reasons, but once the state was really focusing on that and realized how much it was paying in interest every year, it got a lot of public attention. And so while it doesn't make organizations whole and it doesn't solve all the issues, it does show how much money we're wasting. And I think that that's really important. Um, Passport will show where things are in the process, but it doesn't have someone who's designated to move it along. And that's the problem now, is that there isn't someone, which is why we support a bill around you know, increased oversight is there needs to be somebody who's mandated to make sure that these things are moving along in a timely way. And we can't wait while some of these initiatives are great and uh, we need action now and we also need something that will last beyond administrations. I can't come back, we can't re restart our advocacy efforts. If Passport does great, Accelerator was a great fix for two to three years and now there's other issues. And so similarly, like we want things that will last and so this, these pieces of legislation will help that so that we're not restarting advocacy efforts and waiting until there's a you know, critical mass. I also just have to point out one thing is that the loan fund um, does continue, is a great thing, that in, but it's also a Band-Aid. It's not a cure for this issue. Uh, we have had providers report not being able to access the loan fund. It has been maxed out in previous years. We have organizations who are owed 40 and $50 million. And so the idea that the loan fund is you know, 60 million means that there are people who don't have access to it. And they also can't access it for the full value of what they're owed. They can only access it for certain portions of their contracts. And so it's a Band-Aid. Um, it's not a permanent solution to, to the problem. So um, I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And I also want to take a moment to thank Councilmember Brandon for your really great work on this committee. It's been a lot of fun. And we'll definitely miss you. But um, you won't, you know, you, we won't be going very far. <laughs> And I, don't, I don't think I've ever asked you guys, I mean, as, as candidly as you can be on the record, I guess, if you think um, Passport is going to be the panacea that uh, the administration thinks it's going to be. I mean, my concerns are exactly yours, which is um, I like, obviously, the, 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 the fishbowl aspect and shining a light on it, but just being able to see that the system is yeah. dysfunctional is... We're all going to say, yeah, well, you know, we knew we knew this already. Now right. I can see it in a cool <laughs> you know, act or something. Um, so I think that that's always been my biggest concern um, as they sort of tease this, you know, this this blockbuster uh, movie that's coming out. Um, if once it's here, just being able to see things move along at a snail's pace is not going to make anybody happy. Yeah. Um, what else do you think needs to needs to happen? So I think that we, I know, especially knowing the team that's designing Passport, and I think I've said this before, like I have faith in that group. They designed HSS Accelerator. Same here, yeah. And so um, I do think it's going to do what they say that it will do, which is show where things are. That's, so that in that sense, it is a panacea, and I think it will you know, greatly improve things. At the same time, I completely agree. I, it doesn't, I'm not sure it's going to solve the real problem, which is that depending on who's in the management seats at different, whether it's city agencies or oversight or whatever it is or where the priorities are, that a lot of this stuff gets lost in the shuffle. And I think we noticed that when there were all of these contract amendments, which are good things to have these modifications because money was invested, but that's not new. I mean, the amount of them was and the doing it for indirect, not just colas, but colas aren't new. We've seen them before. We've seen, the, seen them go out the door quickly and not so quickly. And I think that that's what we're worried about is that what is the sequencing of making, you know, once we can see where things are, what's the step of putting timeframes on them, which I think is a big thing where our recommendations to the Charter Commission are to establish timeframes to make the payment of interest and to force management reports to come out that show where the retroactivity is, because that's one, a big gap that we have seen is that not being able to point to where the retroactivity is means we have to wait for it to be a crisis before it gets addressed. So I think that those are the pieces that I think are lacking in Passport and need to be there, is that there needs to be someone in charge and there needs to be real consequences for when those things aren't moving um, because just being able to see where they are and working in goodwill works, to, but it depends on who's in the driver's seat and we're not always gonna know who it is. So. 
You guys all sort of on the same page there. Yeah, yeah. What what, what Michelle said. Yeah, I think about that a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just, you, the accountability mechanism is is what's missing, and I think that you know sunlight it can be a motivating factor, but it certainly will depend on uh, which partners are sort of in control at any given time. So so I think that it just needs a little more teeth. Yeah. yeah. I would just say too that sunlight is a great thing, but it's I mean this is not like the sexiest issues under the sun. So. When we even like the controller's report comes out and it shows a 98 or 99 percent retroactivity rate, like what does that matter when we're looking at kind of bigger issues in terms of the political space and like how much capital is being dedicated to that? And so sunlight helps to a certain extent, but it's sunlight in a very shady corner. <laughs> it's not a you yeah, know yeah. a really bright light that's going to get that kind of attention. With regards to uh, passport. Uh, I'm an attorney, I'm also a software developer. When I built software with the federal and state governments, not this one, but others, uh, we did something called user-centered design where the users actually got to say what the product did. Have your organizations been involved in the redesign of Passport? So we were uh, given demonstrations, um, so not involved in the design, but they did um, have a couple of demo sessions where they showed us what the functionality was and did, to their credit, solicit some feedback on reporting functionality and other sort of things that can be customized, but um, I, I don't think it's fair to say that we were integral to the design, although they did make an effort, and I want to give them credit for it, to, to sort of have listening sessions. Um, yeah. And I, like just, I, I would add that Accelerator was built from that perspective of user-centered and us being the end user. HS Accelerator or? Well, yes, HSS Accelerator was built in that way. Like we spent an entire summer, a lot of nonprofits came and went and sat with Mox and went through every single screen. I realized that Passport is not just human for human services, but we haven't had that same experience. And but we have been given previews and been told where we where things are going along the way. But it's not user centered. Is HHS Accelerator a product that you like? Yeah, I mean, I think our. I think it's much, much better than the system that, well, the lack of system that existed before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly sped things up and streamlined processes. And uh, have any of you heard about the new benefits API that we rolled out yesterday? Okay, so this is something I've been working on for about 10 years, but uh, basically you're gonna be able to submit all of the information you have on clients to a benefits API, which will allow you to get answers on the 40 different human service benefits people may be qualified for uh, in your system. Uh, do you have infrastructure, technology infrastructure that would allow you to work with H, you already have systems that work with HHS Accelerator? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this would allow you to pass information through uh, the benefits screening API, so we would update the qualifications, uh, would, what kind of impact do you think that might have with some of your clients and workflow? To, to direct your work providers, yeah. maybe. As an umbrella organization, it's hard for me okay. to envision. Yeah, I would say that we have worked previously on HHS Connect and the, and the public benefit screen that existed there, and that, I think, so I would just compare the two because it sounds like this is a better version of, of some of that and um, that it it's, it's, ma it's exposing the back end so that your s client relationship management tools can directly interface with the city without having to go through paperwork. Yeah, so that sounds great. Sounds yeah, great. so absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, that any time that our providers can e more easily access information and plug in without having to re-plug in client data is obviously a huge win for them. And I guess the only other piece I'd mention is I, I would say there is no, this isn't boring stuff. There's nothing greater than the work that you do. And I look forward to working with you to tell that story. To Council Member Rosenthal to. Just a quick question, piggybacking off of what Council Member. Fellow did. Chair Emeritus. There we go. There go. <laughs> uh, what the Chair is asking about um, being user centric. So did. Passport in its first iteration, my understanding was that they just pulled, used the same uh, facing, forward facing uh, tools that Accelerator had. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. everything that was captured in Accelerator is now being captured in Passport. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, one more panel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.
uh, John McIntosh from Sea Change and Caitlin from Live On. Hey guys, start whenever you're ready. All right, so my name is Caitlin Hosey. I'm here on behalf of Live On New York. I'm the Director of Public Policy, and admittedly, I got the titles wrong on my testimony, but next time I will have the correct <laughs> chairperson's name in there. Um, so Good. Live On New York is a membership organization that represents over 100 community-based organizations that serve over 600,000 older New Yorkers each year. Um, the majority of these organizations uh, hold Department for the Aging contracts, including senior centers, NORCs, case management, home delivered meals, and the gamut of Department for the Aging services that are provided. We are here um, strongly in support of Intro 1450 and Intro, Intro 1448. Live on New York is appreciative of the measures as an important step to compel the city to make timely payments to providers while also making them accountable for any delays. Delays in registration as well as com complex contracting processes overall exacerbate contracting issues and there needs to be immediate attention and resources devoted to solving these concerns. Live on New York would also like to take the opportunity to thank Speaker Johnson and the entire City Council for including 106 million to bring indirect funding rates up to 12% in your um, preliminary budget response which is crucial funding to help close the gap between what it costs to run a program and what the city actually pays, which comes back to a lot of why these contracting issues are so important. The nonprofit human service sector suffers from cash flow problems and chronic underfunding, largely due to the fact that government contracts rarely cover the true operating costs and payment is often late and unpredictable. Contracts and grants must fully cover indirect costs such as information technology to allow them to use HHS Accelerator and such, um, compliance, building contracts, and include cost escalation clauses that can accommodate increases in the cost of doing business and or allow for the surrender of contracts when they become unsustainable due to unforeseen circumstances. The city must work closely with the sector to determine what it actually costs to run a successful program. The new Health and Human Services Cost Policies and Procedures Manual, which was developed as part of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, lays out standardized indirect costs for our sector. However, without increased funding to address the gaps, this manual displays in our contracts, the fiscal crisis we are facing remains unaddressed. Based on the numbers provided by OMB, 250 million would cover the cost to fully implement this manual. We are greatly appreciative of the $106 million in Council's preliminary budget response as a first step towards this goal. It's important to emphasize that delayed and underfunded contracts have a detrimental effect on both the organizations themselves and the communities they serve. I know that this is a point that is well known to you all. As time and energy spent worrying about how to make payroll are finite resources that could be better sp spent bolstering our communities. With 89% of human services contracts arriving at the Comptroller's office after the start date, providers are forced to consider the situation of starting work without a registered contract or not providing services to the communities in which their mission compels them to serve. I also want to, I know we're talking about a lot of wonky issues today, so I wanted to like take a step back a little bit and talk about what are the services that are being put at risk by all of this. Within the Department for the Aging, the majority of these contracts are going to nutrition services for older adults provided through the senior center or home delivered meal system. These services, the majority, for the majority of attendees, the meal that they receive at a senior center makes up one half or more of the daily food intake or nutrients for the day. Hunger affects one in six seniors nationwide, and the risk of hunger is not equal among all populations, as seniors with disabilities, African Americans, and other minorities are more at risk. 
When we speak of late and underfunded contracts, this, these vital nutrition services, is what the city is truly putting at risk. And it is a risk that the nonprofit community can no longer bear the burden of shouldering. Live on New York looks forward to supporting these bills that were aforementioned and the $106 million investment that was proposed this year and supporting your work to make New York a better place to age. Thank you. Thank you. John. Great. Um, uh, Chairman Callos, Chairman Emeriti, uh, Brandon and Rosenthal, thanks for having me again this year. Uh, I'm John McIntosh, managing partner of Sea Change Capital Partners. Uh, sea Change is a nonprofit which makes loans to other not for profits, helps them understand and manage their risk. Um, and we also have a red phone which rings when nonprofits are in distress. So we have seen firsthand the real burden that, um, that even the best run organizations have in managing their cash, given the city's generally late and always unpredictable procurement and payment process. Um, so as a result, we support the bills um, that are proposed uh, around agency oversight process for large contracts, around bridge loans, and around in interest. I should say in passing, we also support the comptroller's recommendations around agencies having a fixed deadline to complete certain tasks and for some sort of publicly available tracking system. Last year, we did a spellbinding report called New York City Contract Delays the Facts, and just for you, released hot off the press, not even in the public domain till tomorrow, we have New York City Contract Delays Volume 2. Um, and I think the analysis uh, serves to emphasize the importance of what you're trying to do here. So last year, based on data for contracts registered in fiscal 2017, if you compare that to the new analysis based on contracts registered in fiscal 18, the situation's a little bit worse, um, just a little. So in, in fiscal 18, the 2,534 contracts registered by the city's social service agencies or issued by the city's social service agencies and registered in fiscal 18 were an average of 221 days late. Um, only 11% were registered on time. Organizations had to wait about a year to be pretty sure their contract had been registered. I'm going to say that's 80% sure. Um, and they had to wait almost two years, 623 days, to be really sure. And that's up. And, and our best guess, our best guess is that the total burden imposed on nonprofits because of those registration delays was about $740 million. Okay. So things haven't gotten better. Um, I'd like to spend a moment on three things that, uh, that I'd like to suggest you should keep in mind if you really want to change the way procurement works. Discretionary contracts, renewals, and battleship organizations. So if you look at the data, about 40% of the contracts are discretionary items, even though they're only 3% of the spending. And they're such a gap between how many contracts there are and how much spending they are because they're so damn small. The, the median contract is less than $80,000. Even though they're only 3% of the spending, they're close to 20% of the financial burden because they're so late. Only 10% were registered within six months. Nonprofits had to typically, so median wait time was 300 days, and it was almost two years to be really sure those contracts had been registered. I used to think that these contracts were ridiculous, they were a nuisance that in a better world would just be abolished. Having looked more closely at the data, I don't think that anymore. The, the truth is that they're the only way that the city touches quite a lot of nonprofits. If you look at the data, the discretionary items went to about 500 organizations but 70% of those didn't get any other support from the city. They're what I'll call discretionary only organizations. Most of those organizations are pretty small. Our best guess is that half those organizations are a million dollars or less, whereas for non-discretionary items, only 10% of your vendors are a million dollars or less. So these, these are important grants to small organizations that are generally otherwise not supported, which of course makes it particularly galling that they have to wait so long. 
On the other hand, I think sea change is pretty sympathetic to the agencies because these awards are only decided at the very, very end, just before the fiscal year starts, and they're so small. And of course, people wait to do the contract by contract ne negotiation around the scope of work because they've got bigger fish to fry. And so we respectfully suggest that you consider doing three things. Make the smaller discretionary items, make them, make sure that they're granted against some predefined scopes of work so the agencies don't have to negotiate contract by contract. I think you could come up with a couple of templates and just, just make sure that every discretionary grant is already in effect assigned a template so the agencies don't need to do the work. Number two, just recognize that you're never ever going to get these registered on time and perhaps make loans against them. Or number three, outsource the whole discretionary procurement process to a separate agency of government or maybe even to a third party. Because these are really small, they're really hard, and, and that's what I think we should do. Chairman, do you have a question? Is there something I can help you with? You look confused. My <laughs> reports can be confusing. I apologize. He's wishing there was more to the report. <laughs> more? Well, I, we can do more. Okay, okay number I'm two. I, I, actually, he's, he's, he knows me too well, even, even though he's been in the council for a year and a half. Uh, we worked together beforehand building pre-K seats in my district. We're up to 14, sorry, we're up to uh, 1,100. But so yeah, I was just, I was trying to find, you, you didn't have data sources uh, cited? This is, this is all, this is all, so the, this is, I would say it's not functionally in the public domain, but all the data that, that we receive from the controller's office is, is the same data that's in Checkbook NYC. So this is, the contract level data is in the public domain through Checkbook NYC, but we've just been able to analyze it in a way that is difficult because you'd have to spend a long time going through Checkbook NYC, but this is all from the controller. It, it, so uh, I'm a big person. I, I believe in trust but verify, not to. Not to Absolutely. And so, uh, to the extent you're comfortable sharing some of your analyses, I'd be interested in seeing the original source material along with the annotations so that I can uh, see, see for myself and see what other data can be I, extrapolated. Not only would I be comfortable, but we all make mistakes, and there's a thing at the back that says, you know, we did our best, so I would, I would welcome a second set of eyes. But uh, we, we, we will definitely be, I will be sending over data sets for you to crunch. Okay. To double check some uh, two, of my crunching. Two other quick things, renewals. So renewals are great in one way. I mean, 36% of renewals are registered before the start date. And on average, organizations only need to wait two months to get their contracts registered. But there's still a lot of pain because there's a long tail of renewals that take some time to register. And, and I just want to say that even the toughest minded not for profit cannot delay and should not delay or stop services under a renewal until the contract's registered. Because unlike a new contract, you'd have to be turning services off for vulnerable New Yorkers, which I don't think any of us want them to do. And so our, our thought there would be that, that, that if a contract is a renewal, even if it hasn't been registered, if the not-for-profit is providing service at the start date, they should be able to get an advance. Final thing, and it makes people uncomfortable, but I think it's a fact. Um, we think procurement should recognize the importance of what I'll call the battleship nonprofit vendors. Something like 85% of the city's social service spending goes to 100 vendors. Vendors which do have multiple contracts with the city and generally speaking do business with the city year in, year out. In fact, just as a, a math exercise, the average grant to each of those 100 vendors, $48 million, is equal to the smallest 600 discretionary grants combined. And so our thought there is that more of the city's procurement resources go towards making sure that those battleship vendors have the organizational characteristics that we want, that they're well governed, that they're free from conflict of interest, that they have appropriate financial and accounting and, and programmatic policies in place, but that if you're able to deem that that's so, that you then spend less time on contract level minutia. And maybe even for those battleships, consider more flexible master contracts 
because it seems odd that for groups that are well known to the city that get very small contracts, there's no difference in process than for the smaller groups that you see once in a while through a one-off discretionary grant. Um, finally, I'd just like to say that at this moment in time, we see that the city needs healthy nonprofit partners more than ever. And I recognize that it's very, very thorny politically to, to pay them more. There's only so much money to go around. But for many organizations, getting paid promptly and predictably is just as important as how much you get paid. And I'm really, really excited that this finally seems to be a moment where, um, because of the bills you've proposed, real procurement reform is possible. Thank you very much. Councilman Rosenthal. Um, thank you so much I, and to both of you, for one, for bringing to life the consequences of these late payments. I really appreciate Live On and its ability to do that. Um, and secondly, for these suggestions, I mean, the one thing I would ask you to, I really appreciate all these suggestions. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the city is guided by state law, which does not allow the city to advance money to a nonprofit. So even in the case of a renewal or the battleship organization, um, state law prohibits the city from making that advancement unless there's a registered contract. So the notion of a master contract that is registered might be a workaround, but um, you know our hands are tied by the state um, yeah, the, for the, some of these ideas. So I'm trying to yeah, yeah if you could I tease I mean, out I think, the idea. I of think it. if you look at the New York City Acquisition Fund. Um, if you look at even at the recoverable grant fund, I, d I do think, I, I understand completely what you're saying, that the possibility of, of, of the city working in some way with private finance, maybe philanthropic foundations, to find, in the best sense of the word, a workaround, um, I'd, op I'd be optimistic that that could happen. And there was, uh, f I can't remember, four or five years ago, the idea of a resilience fund, which never really got off the ground. That, um, that the Fund for the City of New York and NFF and a number of the foundations in town were interested in participating in. And so I, I think there may be a way to use a relatively small amount of, of, of city capital in some way to attract third party capital to make the advances that as you've rightly, rightly said, the city can't make on its own because of state law. So let me just articulate it back to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're suggesting that an organization like Robin Hood right, or, or some foundation might be willing to pony up money to advance right. to uh, a vendor, to uh, JASA or UJA provider um, or Catholic Charities provider for a service and that fund would be replenished when the nonprofit got the money from the city. Right. If you, I mean, if you look at the New York City Acquisition Fund and, and I have these numbers roughly right, so don't hold me exactly to them. Something like $11 million of first loss capital from the city supports a revolving loan fund of, of about $150 million from third party providers to, it's a really important part of the financing infrastructure for affordable housing in the city. And so I think if you, if you, if you think that economically these contracts will ultimately be registered, and that the real risk is actually quite low. It's mostly around timing. I believe if the city were able to find some amount of, of what I'll call first loss capital, you, you might be able to get the Robin Hoods and others to come up and match that many multiples to, to help make advances that, that the city cannot make from uh, under, under, under state regulations. Interesting, thank you very much. So I uh, look forward to, so yeah, just send over the data, I'll take a look, and I really appreciate it. I've, I, I have a download, I do exports from Checkbook NYC occasionally, and uh, I'm also hoping to get the budget side of things and the units of appropriation to get to a place so that um, 
I work with a small company that does uh, financial. Uh, it's called Intuit. <laughs> and um, their foundation, small foundation, small company, and so I'm looking forward to building a tool that can tie spending to, uh, budgeting to spending. It's been a pet project for quite a while. Uh, I have a question for, I think we already went back and forth. I have a question for uh, Live on New York. Uh, in terms of the uh, issue with hunger, one of the reasons I've been so focused on is actually a report you put out about, I'd say five years ago at this point or longer, uh, that said that of all the SNAP recipients in the city and all the SNAP eligible seniors, um, my district had the most. 91% of the seniors who qualify for SNAP, according to your research, don't get it in my district. It's the greatest number in the city. Do you have any updates on those uh, numbers and and how are these uh, how how are these delays uh, affecting SNAP uptake? So I don't have an update on the numbers, but I do have a solution that we would love for you to join us in advocating for on the state level. Um, there's something called the Simplified Elder SNAP app, which would make the procedure for seniors to enroll in SNAP significantly easier, given that seniors' income doesn't vary significantly. Once you are on a fixed income, it isn't going to vary as much. Um, various states have piloted it. It was in the governor's budget this year, but it did not make it into the final budget, and we would love for your support in advocating for that. Um, I do think that in terms of hunger and SNAP recipients, whether or not they're using senior centers and how they're meeting their nutritional needs, we're seeing a significant uptick in food bank usage among seniors, in senior center usage among seniors, of seniors requesting a, a six a weekend meal, a, um, a meal that they could take home potentially. Um, so the hunger, the needs of hunger among the older adult population are consistent year to year, if not growing. Um, and it's something that these contracts certainly exacerbate the difficulty for providers to provide a quality meal when you're being underfunded. The first thing that you're going to have to do is cut the quality of the ingredients. Um, and it's certainly affecting how providers can offer a meal that's culturally competent that is meeting the needs of the communities they serve. We've been working with uh, Albany uh, since I got elected on something called integrated eligibility, which would be the replacement for welfare management system, which would actually allow us to build automatic benefits, which would actually hopefully get us even past even having to do an elder SNAP application, mm -hmm. but literally just like, we have your information, here's your SNAP card. Uh, conservative leaning states already do this. Uh, they already mail people their SNAP cards pre-filled. Uh, I, I mentioned at the other panel, uh, we now have a benefits API where any client relationship management tool that you use to do case management would be able to pass information about your clients to the city, get an er initial eligibility determination uh, would that be helpful to you in the work that you do? So Live on New York has a benefits outreach team, and I'm excited to go back and tell the director of benefits outreach about this, and I know she'll be thrilled to hear that there are people thinking of ways to make her life easier because it, it's those small changes that can make a big difference in your ability to serve clients. My, my goal is to get the amount of time doing paperwork for both benefits processing and also just getting paid to do the work you're doing down as far as possible to, to 0% if possible or 1% so you can spend your time, whether it's social workers or others, just focused on helping people with their problems. Absolutely. Uh, I want to excuse this panel. Thank I you. want to uh, thank uh, Chair Brennan for his amazing work on this committee. I, I will just take an exception to note uh, there's been a lot of turnover and a lot of committees in the time that I've been in the council, but rarely have I seen advocates come out in, in such strong support. And uh, we, it, I, I am glad we will st you, you won't be going far and that uh, you're a friend and we will continue to work together. And what I'll say is just the 
there's a, there's a lot that this committee can do and uh, we will definitely hold folks accountable and uh, I think the goal is to have as wide attempt as possible to help as many as possible and also to just broaden the scope so that we, we have Contracts are everybody's issue, no matter what you care about. Uh, with that said, this is, and thank you to the staff for this uh, amazing prep work. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.